mention where we are on, on the, the plan of the talk. So essentially, I, I, I talked yesterday about uh, the classical learning or the standard learning theory, which uh, is really based on what we call uh, puck bounds. And I didn't say it, but puck stands for probably approximately correct, which is a little bit funny. But essentially, as I said, I mean, it gives you some bound on the generalization in terms of two numbers, epsilon, which is what we call accuracy, or, or, or generalization bound, on, a bound on the generalization gap, if you want, and, and delta, which is the confidence. So the confidence stands for the probably, probably and the Accuracy stand from the, for the approximately correct. Yeah. So just to make sure that you understand where it comes from. So there are these two numbers. I mean, the probability of uh, the accuracy of the algorithm or the, 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 the eventual rule or the, the difference between the training and generalization and so on. So, uh, so I, I hope I convinced you that entropy is a, is a very interesting uh, measure, which we are going and, and, and that generalization of entropy, which are related to mutual information, really gives us uh, some interesting characterization of neural networks. And eventually, I'm going to focus now on, on what I call the information plan theorem. So essentially, the story is that we, we look at this multi-layer system as each layer made out of two maps, one which I call the encoder of the layer, which is the stochastic mapping in general from the input pattern, which can be very complex. I mean, we're going to assume that it's a high entropy pattern, uh, and we're going to confine ourselves to what we call typical patterns, I mean, patterns which are uh, in this uh, set of typical, typical objects. And uh, so the encoder is, in general, a stochastic map from the input to the layer, and the decoder is a map from the layer to the desired output. So, and I'm going to argue that when the problem becomes very large, the only two numbers you want to care about are the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the decoder. But I'm going to make a distinction. So for any encoder, for any encoder, so any, any map, from the input to some internal representation, I'm sorry, from the input to the internal representation, any map like this, uh, there is the optimal, or if you want, uh, the base optimal, base optimal decoder, which is not necessarily the, the, the actual rest of the network, so, I mean, this is, uh, there is the real decoder, which is what the network is doing for us. But if I had all the data in the world, I could actually decode this representation with the optimal decoder. So, P of Y given T, let's call it B optimal or base, is simply what? So, this is just using this, essentially, I'm trying to predict the true label, the desired label from the decoder, and the only thing which intervenes between, between each one of those layers and, and, the, and the actual output is this uh, input layer. So this is, again, using this Markov condition, this is simply the sum of all possible x's of py given x, px given t. So if you think about it, this is just using the fact that there is a Markov chain here, y, x, t, eventually. So for this is true for any t. Then, of course, the layers of a deep neural network form a Markov chain of representations, which are now denoted by t, t1 and so on, ti, t, there. And I'm going to focus on the behavior of those representations. And this is a Markov chain, which means that information is only going down along this chain. Yes. Yes. First of all, why do you have the Y on the left-hand side? Okay, so I thought I said it yesterday, but it's all right. Uh, so Y is the desired output. 
desired label. This is the, the, the data that I get. I mean, so essentially, I have this joint distribution of x and y. I get some points. And eventually, what we do is map x through a cascade of such representations. And eventually, from the last hidden layer, I'm generating what I call y hat, which is the actual output of the network. But this is not y. This is the, the output of the network, which, which eventually, if we train it well, is going to be close to y. So that's why I, I, I put this on this side, because this is a map from the last hidden layer, or from the last layer. Now, uh, the actual y is here, because essentially what I'm giving you is this. So essentially, this is input representation. I'm giving you labels. And then I generate representations of x. And they belong to y in this way. I mean, the only way I can actually predict the actual y is go through x. So this is essentially just an implementation of this, of this Markov chain, y, x, and then one of those t's. This is the actual true one. Now, if you think about it, I mean, you're given data. I'm giving you a label. And then I'm giving you something which depends on this label. And it's here. It's to the left of the representation. You're, got, no, you're not getting the y. And, and then, of course, using this, using this statistic, the sample of this distribution, and generating, I'm training the network and generating representations. But the true y is on this side of the Markov chain. So in order to actually, so if you think about it, if this is the Markov, if this is my Markov chain, uh, so this is, this is the, this is the best prediction of the desired y that you can make. This is all you know about y from the representation t. So this is maybe confusing for those of you who have seen it before. But I hope that most of you, this is simple. I mean, so essentially, this is the Markov chain I'm having. x, y. Then from x, I'm generating representations of x. And from the last one, I'm generating my prediction. The prediction should be close to y eventually, if, if I can train it well. But y is different from y hat. So this is what I call the optimal decoder. And the true decoder, the network decoder, is actually, uh, of course, uh, this py hat given t, which I'm not going to discuss too much. So actually, what I said, what I showed you before in this movie, and I'm going to come back to it in a second, was uh, that is actually an implementation of what I call the information plan theorem, which is, this is something a little bit more abstract, and it takes time to, to, to grasp. But uh, essentially, I'm saying that when the network becomes very large, you're still confused. That's right. Because uh, given x. I don't need t in order to say everything I know about y. Remember that I have the joint distribution. I have p of y given x and p of x. That's, this is essentially my rule. OK? So essentially, given x, I know how to predict y. This is given. This is not part of the network. This is data. This is data. Then I get a sample or, or data or training data, which is essentially a collection of uh, xi, yi, pairs like this, which are samples from this distribution, pxy. OK? This has nothing to do with the network. So that's why they stand outside of the network. Now, the t's are representations of x. I mean, for any given x, there is a t. I don't need y for that. What I do need y for is for training the network. But once the, train, the network is trained, I mean, the weights are fixed. And only then, this is a Markov chain. Otherwise, it's not a Markov chain, because I'm actually recycling the data, and I created all sorts of dependencies. But for a fixed, so this, is, this, this Markov picture is true for fixed Ws, for any fixed Ws. Once the network is fixed, then there is this Markov chain of representations. And I'm going to discuss the representation, not the weights. You're absolutely right that during the training, I'm using all sorts of feedbacks because I'm using backpropagation and so on. And then, of course, I create dependencies between y and the weights and x. But once weights are fixed, any given weights, this is the, the Markov chain. 
no, here you can't because you're actually representing x, not y. You're given the pattern. I'm given your image. I don't, I don't have your label. I'm given an image. I'm generating representations of this image for any given w. Given w, so this is important. So this is what I could do without knowing anything about the network. I mean, if you give me the joint distribution just using this Markov chain, this is the optimal decoder of this layer. Just give me t, generate this reverse decoding. So px given t is the reverse encoder, I'm sorry. The reverse channel. That's why I'm using base rule here. So essentially, I'm, I'm mapping in order to see what is the best prediction of y from t, I'm just using this Markov chain. And this is for fixed, fixed uh, encoder, or w, the weights. It's, and what's confusing you, which is, of course, correct, that during the training, there is a feedback here, which is going to mix the dependencies completely. But I'm not talking about the training. I'm talking after the training. Yes? Remove the X? Yes. This is my input layer. Yeah. So why do you want to remove it? No, but you don't. I mean, in practice, what you do with these networks is you show a pattern, let's say an image, pixels of an image. You don't know why. But what the network is generating for you are these representations. I'm saying again, given Ws, when the weights are, are given, then you don't know why. Of course, if I knew why to begin with, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> If, if, I knew, if I knew this joint distribution of x and y, then the, the problem is solved. I mean, you just do the base, uh, the base decoder, and that's it. You don't need the base decoder. You just take for every given x, you, you, you give y by the, by the maximum likelihood or whatever. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is important. I mean, I know this is confusing. But it, remember, those weights are fixed in this picture. Now. During the training, we looked at these two numbers. So this was this movie that I showed you last night. We looked at these two numbers. This is the mutual information for every, every point on this plane is for a different set of Ws. Yeah? So W is changing here. But this is the initial condition. And be, again, because of data processing inequality, I have this drop of information. It's not, it doesn't have to be this. And this is because of the special architecture of this network. This network is actually. I'll show it to you later on. It's, it's some sort of an Eiffel Tower, and the layers get narrower and narrower. And this is why information really drops for, with, with random. Now, there's a big issue. There is a delicate issue of how do we really estimate this information. But I don't want to discuss it now. I'll discuss it later. We do it by essentially binning the, 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 the units of the, of, the, of the layers and, and discretizing everything. And I argue that this is not important. This is a very good proxy to the true information. Even if you don't discretize it, I'll come back to this later. But that's why you see this very sharp drop. And you see this very nice concentration of all the layers. The only random number here is the weights. And not, I mean, of course, it's not, the weights are randomized because I start with the randomized initial conditions, different from every network. And then, of course, the examples is a, is a finite sample. In this case, it is trained on 75% on of the data. 80% of the data. And the data, in this case, are patterns of 12 binary inputs. So it's a very small network. That's why the entropy, the, the information, or the maximum mutual information is the entropy of the pattern. And the entropy is 12 bits here. So 12 bits means that there are only 2 to the 12 possible patterns. So this is a very small network. And one bit of output. And you see that the initial layer, the blue one there, the, 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 it's actually more than one layer there, uh, the, 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 the closest to the input have very high information because essentially they don't lose any information about the input. It's just a, essentially one-to-one -one transformation of the input. So no information is lost about the label and the input. That's why it's very high up there. One bit of information about the label and 12 bits of information about the, the input. But once I move through this chain of representations, I'm losing information initially. And then when you train it, I'll just show it again just to amuse you, uh, it, you get this very nice picture that they all come up very quickly to more or less the diagonal here, and then slowly moving to the left. Hand. 
And what I want to do now is really to understand this picture as much as we can and see what happens there. But eventually, I'm going to, to argue that there is this theorem that for very large networks, or very large patterns, when, the, when I can actually talk about typical inputs only, and that's really the large, the large scale learning hypothesis, that I care only about typical inputs, not about every input. And typicality, by the way, is defined by the entropy of the input, which is a distribution-dependent quantity. So then I argue that only these two numbers, the information of the encoder, that is the information between x and the layer, and the information of the optimal decoder, which is this base optimal decoder, these are the two things that are telling me the interesting story. And the interesting story for learning theory is the trade-off between sample complexity and accuracy. I mean, what is the generalization error and how many samples you need in order to, to generate this generalization error in the best possible way. So it's again, I'm still under the, the, the dogma of uh, statistical learning theory. Well, and I'm talking about what we call sample complexity. I'm not talking yet about the computational issues. And in this case, I argue that it's the mutual information of the encoder and the optimal decoder of the last hidden layer, the last hidden layer, which are actually telling me, at least in principle, it's not really a very practical bound, but in principle, because I can't calculate these quantities, these two mutual informations for, for any real problem in practice. I have to only estimate it. But if I could have these two values of mutual information, then they would tell me exactly what is the bet, best accuracy that you can achieve with a given sample size of, of random examples. OK, so, so what I want to do now is to convince you that this is actually true. So again, uh, there, there, is, uh, there are two issues here. One of them is understanding the role of these two numbers. I mean, information about input, information about desired labels. And then understand the, the structure of this dynamics. I mean, this is the SGD dynamics, the stochastic gradient descent, which is taking me through these passes. And I want to understand both. What happened at the end, at the end of the story? I mean, what, 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 I'm saying that this point E on this curve is where the last hidden layer eventually converged to. And the value of information about the input and information about the output is really telling me the story I want to know. But then the interesting, the really interesting story is what happens to the other layers. I mean, why all of them move, or most of them move to the left? And what dominates, and wh why do they stop at some places like L3, L4, and so L2? You see, you see that the layers stack somewhere in very interesting places. They don't go, go all the way to the end. Yes? Yes, absolutely. So the reason it doesn't, the weights can change, but as long as it's a one-to-one -one transformation of the input, there's no loss of information. And there's no loss of information about either the input or the output. It's just uh, some, so let's say, if the first layer is only decoding some sort of encryption of the data, which is uh, crazy, it can be crazy computationally, but it doesn't change information at all. So then it will stay there. Yeah. So That's right. All the story about uh, the dynamics of the gradient descent I'm going to, to de delay for now, just for a few, a few minutes. But uh, so that, that's the plan for today. I really want to understand this picture. Uh, and I want you all to believe me in some sense that, uh, such a, that this is a very typical picture. I mean, this is what's going to happen in most standard neural networks trained with general, uh, with general SGD. Of course, the, the architecture is going to affect this picture in various ways. If I, change, if I take, for example, all layers to be of equal width, or, or, or I do some sort of games with you know, convolutions or with uh, ResNets or whatever, all those tricks, they're all going to affect this picture, but not dramatically. They're just going to change the shapes of those, of those lines, but not nothing. Of course, there can be, as, as, as Bert said, I mean, there can be layers that don't do anything, which means that all the crazy dynamics of the weights is not going to change the information between the input and the layer. And those are going to get stuck or get degenerate. I mean, I can get things like this in the middle. So I get, can get several layers, one on top of the other in this plan. This is a very degenerate picture. I'm taking millions of parameters and project them to two dimensions. So obviously, there are many, many different networks. 
that have exactly the same location in this plane. Okay, so, so and I actually argue that this degeneracy is really not what we want, we care about at this point. Yes, please. It's very small. Yeah. So essentially, think about it this way. Essentially, what, I'm, what the network is trying to do is to bring all the patterns that have label one and all the patterns that have label zero into two separate subspaces, where it, which can be linearly separate. Right. So, but here That's it. And, and then eventually, they remember only one bit about the input, sure. which is precisely this bit that partitioned the input into these two parts. Sure. Right. Right, absolutely. What, what is the next okay, yes. Is there? So Take just the input data. Input data has all the information about the label and all the information about, and, and still you cannot extract it because it's highly entangled, I mean, in some sense. I mean, exactly. there's no simple way of separating these two groups. Okay, so, so bear with me. I, I, I promise to answer this question. Okay, it's, this is exactly the point. Okay. So, so far, I'm, uh, so what's really happening through these cascades of, of representation? And well, why is it that the last layer is really easy to separate? I'm essentially just one hyperplane is going to put one label on one side. And in the first layer, it's almost impossible to do it. It's impossible to do it in most cases. I mean, there's no single pixel or single bit in my image that tells me this is me or not me. It's highly distributed everywhere. So, so that's why I, I need to, to <laughs> To scramble it or this, this scramble it or to do some this, this representation change. And, and the whole miracle of deep neural networks is how does it happen? I mean, what in this stupid SGD algorithm is actually causing this separation? Okay, and why the network, the layers actually help you? So, so I, want to, I want to come back to trying to, so I showed you yesterday this bound. The, 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 pack, the classical pack bounds of learning. And uh, so essentially telling me, look, uh, in general, the generalization gap or the generalization error is bounded by the log of the epsilon cover of my cardinality space, of my hypothesis space, plus something which depends on the confidence delta, divided by 2m. I proved it yesterday. And I said that in general, the nice spaces are the spaces where the cardinality of, this, of, the, of, the, of the, the cover is scales like 1 over epsilon to the d with some dimension d, and if you just plug this there, you get this d over m uh, log 1 over epsilon as the dominant factor. So essentially, as long as m is smaller than d, I don't generalize, and once m great, get, get, get larger than d, this epsilon bound becomes meaningful. And uh, this is really the classical picture, and this d, in most cases, this d is, is the VC dimension, which is just a slightly more complicated way of defining this dimension, but it's the same thing exactly. And, uh, and this is deep learning. This is learning theory. As I said, it doesn't work for deep learning. Clearly doesn't work for deep learning. So I'm going to, to play a slightly different game, which I call the input compression game, or the input compression bound. So instead of focusing on the hypothesis class, which is the class of all possible functions where I want this uniform convergence uh, of, of the generalization gap uh, in, in all, on, over all the class, <laughs> I'm going to look at X itself. And now again, the motivation here is to understand neural networks. So I want to understand how those maps to the layers really change the structure of the input. So each of those layers is some sort of a injection, or if you want a partition, if you think about the neurons as just hard uh, threshold functions, that's for simplicity. So this is just mapping all the Xs into some finite compartments which can be hard or soft, I don't care at this point. So I want to characterize this partition, which I call the input partition. So in this case, I, I, so this is my space of all possible x's, and essentially I want to understand how such a partition of the input, so let's say that all the x's in this uh, small ellipse are, are mapped to one configuration of the layer. 
all the others to other configuration. So this is some sort of partition or clustering, if you want, of the, of the inputs into, into, which are characterized by the value of the hidden layer, which is a very large number because I have a lot of hidden units. Okay? So, but in principle, I have a cover. So now if you think about all possible functions, let's say also, also all, all possible Boolean functions, so if I add all of x, so this is a somewhat confusing notation, but the, the, this class, 2 to the cardinality of x, if x is finite, I mean finite number of possible objects, is the number of all possible functions, Boolean functions from x to 0, to, to zero 1. Okay? This is clear. Okay, so this is no hypothesis class. I mean, this, this would have been, I assume, every possible function. By the way, if you plug this in this bound, you get a, a log of 2 to the x, which is the cardinality of x over m, which tells you that essentially you need to label all the data. So this is the no free lunch theorem, if you want. I, I can't get anything for free. If I don't assume something about the function, nothing will happen. Okay, so just plug 2 to the x there, you get x over m. X over M means that the number of examples have to be essentially the number of patterns. Not very interesting. <laughs> but if my layers is actually co compressing the representation in the sense that it maps it into this cover, so all the patterns in this set are going to have the same label for some, somehow, eventually, then I need one label in every one of those covers, not more. Have, because all of them have the same label, one label is enough to, to map all of them, okay? So in principle, if I knew somehow to partition my input into classes or into, into groups that have the same label, or very close label, then the number of labels that I would need, the number of examples will go, or the, if you want, the, the number of possible functions is not the two to the s, but two to the cardinality of this cover, which I call T epsilon. Okay. So I actually argue that the layers are doing precisely that. I mean, they're going eventually to cover in a coarser and coarser cover because of this Markov chain representation. So the covering, the, the, the partition is always a, a coarsening of the previous partition. It cannot be otherwise. This is exactly the processing inequality. I can only lose information. So I'm going to have this cascade of covers, which eventually, and, and the cardinality then goes from 2 to the x to 2 to the cardinality of the cover. All right. This is true for any representation, even if there's only one representation. That's right, but then the layers are going to coarsen this partition. So the number of partitions is get, get smaller. The number of par yeah, the number of partitions, the size of the partition gets smaller. Yeah, so absolutely. This, is the one of the last layer or the first layer? At this point, I'm talking about any layer or any representation, any representation. I don't say care about the layers yet. Okay, so now the question is so. So there's one uh, piece of mathematics that I need to, to fill in here. So first of all, we move from deterministic rules to stochastic rules. I already said that. I just want to emphasize it again. So I assume this, that the rule is actually determined by this probability distribution of the label given x and not y of x. So instead of uh, you know y equals uh, some function of x, I'm actually thinking about Either y equals some function of x plus some noise, so there is some intrinsic pattern noise, and if, let's say that if this noise is, is Gaussian or whatever, I don't know, with zero mean and some standard deviation, uh, then, uh, then this is going to create a, a, a stochastic rule. Yeah, okay? So I can only say that the probability of the label given x is determined by this noise. Okay, so this is just a, a very standard trick in dynamical systems, when I add noise to the input, Another way of saying it is that there's some sort of quantization on x, or simply the rule itself is stochastic, which means that all I know is the probability of the label given x. Of course, if the noise goes to zero, if it's very small, then it goes back to a deterministic rule if I want. But it's much more general to think about stochastic rules. Now, for, for, for technical reasons, which, which you, see, you see already, uh, I really want this to be strictly within the simplex means that this is going to be greater than zero or greater than some delta which is greater than zero and less than one minus delta. So in some sense, I, I'm thinking about the simplex of y. So you all know what the simplex of y is. It's the set of all possible distributions over y. So I'm just denoting it by a triangle. 
although this is actually the, the, two, the, the, the one dimensional symmetry is just uh, the interval, zero, one, but just for, for the graphical. So essentially, I'm cutting a little boundary out of the simplex of width delta. So in some sense, I'm not, I don't want fully deterministic rules. Eventually, I'm going to take this delta to be zero, to, to take the limit of delta goes to zero. But at this point, let's keep this delta inside. So I'm avoiding completely deterministic rules. OK, so these uh, margins of size delta, which can be very small, are going to be excluded from the simplex. And then the question is, OK, so what is going to replace my generalization error? So generalization error was the mismatch in the label between two hypotheses, OK? So, uh, so it was uh, this uh, distance between, let's say, h1 and h2 in my class, which was, in general, the probability of the, of the disagreement between h1 and h2, this uh, symmetric difference. This is uh, just uh, reminding you from yesterday. So I'm going to turn this error. So this was the error that h1 is making with respect to, to h2. So if the rule is stochastic, the most natural generalization of this error is, is what considered by, by most people as, as to be the natural generalization. It, it's, it's the L1 difference, or what we call the, the, the variation distance, which is essentially the known one difference between, between H1, between P, P, or, uh, P1 of Y and P2 of Y. OK, so this is L1, which means it's the sum over all Ys of P. Of, so this is, uh, you know, in a, in a more general framework, let's say you have two, two distributions. So let's say this, uh, this two distribution, P1 and P2, this is the measure of the disagreement between them. So it's this area. This is the L1 difference. So this is the L1 norm, or what we call the variation distance. So the variation distance in general is just the integral of T PY P, P, y, P1 minus P2 uh, absolute value dy. OK? So if y is a continuous variable. So this is just the, the absolute L1 norm. And uh, if you think about it, if the rules are deterministic, which means y is it, P, y is either 1 or 0, this is going to be exactly the, the, the measure of this agreement. So this is a natural generalization of or error. Now, what is nice about this L1 norm, so this is the L1 norm. I, I, I denoted it by 1. And then, so this is the L1 square norm. So I just normalized this. I, dis, I just square this, this norm or square this integral. And uh, so the variation of this. And, and what we know, and I can prove it, we don't have the time. This is the standard. Uh, a standard statement in, 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 in measure theory, in, in, in standard deviation, or in large deviation, or in whatever you can read it in Cover and Thomas. It's, it's known as the Pinsker inequality. So the Pinsker inequality is telling me that the L1 norm, so this P1 of y minus P2 of y, uh, is actually bounded by, or up, up to some constant, uh, 2 and 2, whatever. Square, so the L1 norm square of these distributions is bounded by the KL divergence of PY, P1Y, and P2, P2Y. Now, if you ask uh, which, what, or, this is symmetric, this is not symmetric, doesn't matter, in any order. So the, mean, the smaller of the two. OK, so, so this, is, this is known as Pinsky inequality. And you can read about it in Wikipedia if you want. You see the proof. The proof is actually very simple. But it's very elegant. I don't want to discuss it. It's actually also what we call a converse or inverse converse inequality. So the L1 norm is actually bounding the decal divergence from above. But this is highly sensitive to the minimal difference here. If this minimal difference uh, is 0, then it's 1 over this minimal difference has to be kept. But in principle, what I argue is this, that this uh, bound it's going to be tight in some limit. So it's both that the KL divergence is bounding the L1 norm, 
and that the KL divergence is bounded by the L1 norm if you assume this, this delta separation, so there are no zero probabilities in your space. So it's going to be bounded by one over delta times the KL. So the one of delta is a bit tricky, I don't need it here. But in principle, if I'm really bounding my distribution to be inside the simplex, then I can, the log of pro the probabilities is well behaved, there are no zeros, and everything is bounded, and this is smooth manifold, and, and that's, that's a, nice, a nice setting to have for mathematicians. Okay, now, uh, so this is nice because if I can bound the KL divergence on average between any X and any representation of X, whatever X and T is, so instead of P1 and P2, I now look at two, two possible uh, and distributions, let's say two dependences of X, and so how, how X depends on Y versus how T depends on Y. So this is the optimal, the optimal prediction of Y from the data, and this is the prediction of Y from the representation. So it's this scale divergence which I want to minimize. Now there's a, a very simple uh, relation using this Markov chain. I'll give you another small exercise. I simply don't have the time to, to prove it here. So if I average this DKL between PY given X and PY given T, where T is any representation of, of X. So T is anything that obeys this Markov chain. And, I'm, and PY given T is, in this case, the, the optimal, yeah, the base optimal, the best I can do. So it's the same base optimal I wrote there. So this, if I take this KL and then average it with respect to both X and T, which means actually average over the encoder, then this is precisely equals IXY, the mutual information, original mutual information between X and Y, minus IXT. Uh, IYT, sorry. Uh, IXY versus minus ITY. So this is a very simple lemma that I want to, to write here. But what it means that if I actually increase the mutual information on Y, which is the, remember, the yx of my information plan coordinates, then I improve generalization. Because there is a direct bound because between this, so this difference is larger than the L1 norm according to this, which is the generalization error in any, in any reasonable measure. Okay, so, so the first axis is very clear. Any training algorithm which will improve generalization, no matter what, has to move the points of the representation up in this plane. Okay, so that's obvious. I mean, obvious now. So that's why we must see this uh, increasing uh, information. If, if, I mean, no matter if I use the stochastic gradient descent or, or anything else, coming up, you know, like balloons in, in, in this plane is something I expect from any learning rule, including our brain, by the way. I mean, if my brain is using, I don't know, whatever learning rule, if it improves generalization, I get to get very good performance. I expect my encoders of the representations of the data in my brain, whatever they are, I mean, they're very complicated. I mean, they have a, a lot of those, you know, in V1, I have different than in the cortex and so on. There are many, many layers in, not many, but there are several, certainly several layers in vision and several layers in, in auditory perception and so on. Not everything is so nicely layered, but uh, whatever happens in the brain, the information about why should, should increase. Now, so it, it actually gets uh, interesting to ask what is the structure of this plan in terms of encoders? I mean, so where can I be at all? So it's actually very easy to see that there are no points here. There are no points, there are no, no encoders that keep all the information on X and no information on Y. Think about it for a second. If it keeps all the information on X, then this Markov chain implies that I have a lot of information about Y. So there are no points here. This is an empty region. On the other hand, there also, what happens up? So, so there, actually, we calculated this. I don't have it here. It's a new paper. Most of the encoders, if you take random encoders, just random weights, they're going to lie on a line here. So that's actually a, a very big density of encoders somewhere in the middle. Depends on the problem, but depends on PXY, depends on the, 
what type of random encoders actually consider. But there are no encoders here. And, there are, and, and once you get up, the number of possible encoders get smaller and smaller, actually exponentially smaller. So the most, the most natural, because you, you put this constraint on the information on the label, and this is going to dilute the number of possible encoders until you get to very high information on the label, and then something interesting happens there. So the most natural question to ask is, uh, is what happens, what is the limit? I mean, how far I can actually go up for any given representation? And, and also, of course, what happened to this layer? Why do they spread up so nicely in terms of information about the input? Okay, so, so now I, I'm going to go back to this bound. So remember, I'm, I'm talking about what we call typical patterns. So again, just to, to remind you, so what I showed you yesterday is that for independent uh, inputs for whatever distribution, this limit is exactly the entropy. This is actually true even if there are dependencies. So as long as, let's say, if my axes are, let's say, a, a, a first order Markov chain, so I'm going to factorize them conditioning on the previous, so, so P of x1 to xn is going to be a product of fpx1 times px2 given x1 times px3 given x2 and so on. It's a Markov chain. And eventually in the large n limits, it's again, it looks like a product of conditional independent terms and the central limit theorem under very wide conditions works. And I get the center again, the same number. But actually, if you think about graphical models, for example, so each, each variable depends on some parents of some, of some uh, you know, variables that influence it, that are directly connected to it. And again, if this parenthood uh, of this neighborhood uh, conditioning is more or less uniform everywhere, like in a, pixel, in a picture, for example, every pixel is largely dependent by the neighborhood. So the, the color of this pixel, if I give you the, the colors of the neighbors, in most cases, I can predict it very well, and so on. So, so there is this uh, Markov conditioning, and again, this holds. Actually, there is a very general theorem, which is called the Shannon McMillan Bryman uh, theorem, which tells us that under very wide, very mild and very wide conditions, I mean, this is a uh, Godic uh, uh, in the dynamic system case, or, uh, or some sort of uh, fine bounded or bound bounded degree graphical model, or something like this. This limit exists, and the same argument about concentration of the of the limit to the entropy holds in a much more general setting. Okay, so I'm going to again consider only typical patterns. And then I said this is true for Markov random fields and hidden Markov models and, and Hamiltonian with pairwise interactions which are, which are bounded and so on, and most common uh, uh, graphical models. I mean, essentially everything that we really use in machine learning, or in physics, by the way, are, are, are Hamiltonians with finite number of interactions or bounded number of interactions and so on. Okay, or bounded or average. I mean, you know, even the, the SK models, uh, which is, has essentially a random interaction, obeys this rule in some sense, even spin glasses. So, uh, and it's certainly true for things like images and speech and text and all the things that we really applied. Uh, uh, those. So this is a very general statement. So this typicality argument is going to hold in a, very, in a very general setting. And then notice that all the typical patterns essentially have the same distribution, the same probability, which is just 2 to the minus n or, or e to the minus n, depending on the basis of the log. Yeah? Uh, uh, 2 to the minus n, if I'm using bits, the entropy. So they're all equally probable. Which means that the size, just one second, the size of these typical sets is exactly one of, over this entropy is 2 to the nh. Because all of them are equally likely, and they're talking about finite sets, so the size is just 2 to the nh. So this is really a very important part of this typicality argument. They're all equally probable, all typical patterns have exactly the same probability, which is determined by the entropy. Now, I'm going to assume that my partition this partition over uh, that induced by the network is large enough such that the condition, the patterns which are mapped into one of these cells, so which I mean I condition it on the, on the, on the partition, on the clustering on, uh, that is induced by the layers, is also typical, which means that I can estimate the probability of a pattern in, in such partition by 2 to the minus n, the conditional entropy. Now this is a slightly tricky argument, you have to be careful here, but it's actually for physicists, this should remind, I mean, the argument about the, the Gibbs distribution, uh, 
in, in, in thermodynamics. So essentially, one of the ways of, of generating Gibbs distribution is to show, to, to, to put, let's say I take my glass of water and I think about small parts of it, small drops, which are large enough to assume equilibrium in each one of them, and then I get exactly the same argument. So, so, uh, so this is just assuming that the partition is sufficiently large to assume typicality argument even for the maps inside of this partition. Okay, so I'm going to use this in order to refine this bound. And of course, there's also an, an issue about the concentration of the information. Why do I get these two points center? Okay, ask a question. Yes, okay, so my comment about glasses, glasses keep it aside for a second. I don't want to get into it. I'm talking about simple things. Okay, at this point, spin glasses are a little more complicated and require more time. Not that we can't say anything about them, but at this point, leave it aside. Okay, so, uh, so what I'm going to say is that actually it's very easy to see why those two quantities, ixt and ity, really concentrate. So the first one, if I have an, indeed this... Uh, this uh, factorization uh, property, which means that the probability of x given t can be written as a product of pxi given the parents in the graph and t, and the probability of px can be written as a similar product, then this is a simple sum of, independent, uh, of, of conditional independent things for the same argument exactly, and central limit theorem tells me that these things are going to concentrate. I, ity, by the way, is a little more tricky because it's a sum of products. It's not, it's not like partition functions in, in statistical physics. So sums of products uh, also tend to self-average. And as you all know, for example, in spin glasses or in, in, in mean field theory, when we calculate the free energy of a spin glass, we average the log of z, not z. We average z, you get uh, the unneed approximation, which is usually wrong. But the log of z is what is why log of z? Because log of z concentrates. So for similar reasons, which you can argue much more carefully, ITY also concentrates, although it looks like a sum of products. But there's the most likely product in this, in this, uh, in this sum, which is going to dominate everything in the large n limit. So it's actually quite clear why these two numbers really concentrated. You see that they actually concentrate pretty nicely, even for this very small problem, I mean, 12 bits only. And we, well, when we increase the network, this concentration gets sharper and sharper until essentially you see one pointer. It's really very, very nice. Even with convolutions or whatever you want. The only issue is how to estimate information. So I'm going to go back to this bound and I'm going to refine it. So I want to estimate the size of this partition. So how do you do it? Again, in the, so what I just told you is that the size of the typical x is just two to the hx where I suppress the n here. n is, uh, rather than looking at the density of the entropy, I look at the entropy itself. So, so this is 2 to the h. This is just a typicality argument. Now I, I assume that each of those cells is also typical in the same sense, which means that the size of each of these cells on average is precisely 2 to the conditional x on t. This is what I just said. OK, so if you buy this, what is the number, the cardinality of the partition? It's 2 to the h divided by 2 to the h t given x. Yeah, OK. <laughs> the total volume divided by the average volume of these spaces. And which is what? It's precisely 2 to the i. h of x minus h of x given t is i. It's the emission information. OK, so this is precisely, by the way, the argument used by Shannon in his coding theorem. So those of you who find this familiar, it's the same argument he's using in the in the both coding theorem, uh, the channel coding theory, and the, and the, and the rate distortion theory. One, one says a cover and, and one says a packing, but it's the same argument. And I'm using it a slightly different way. So I'm saying this cardinality, which really dominates the number of functions or the number of labels that I really need if I actually get homogeneous cells eventually, is the cardinality of this is 2 to the 2 to the i. because t of epsilon is 2 to the i, and the number of functions was 2 to the cardinality of t of epsilon. So this is somewhat surprising. You get this double exponent, 2 to the 2 to the i. This is where people stop to believe me, but stop believing me at some point. But it's true. I, so now you take the log there from the cardinality bound, 
And you get that epsilon square is actually bounded by two to the mutual information between x and t, plus this log delta, but I'm, log delta is going to be negligible for in, in the larger limit. Log, let's say that you take delta to be one of a million, okay? 10 to the minus six. So this is six, okay? And, and, the, and these are orders of millions, okay? Who cares? So the whole, the whole argument about confidence is becoming uh, negligible in the, in the typical large problem. But what is really surprising is that the mutual information, it's two to the mutual information which acts like the dimensionality of the class. So this gives you a very good incentive for this algorithm to actually move to the left. Because if my la last layer, which is really where, where I'm actually doing my prediction eventually, has a very small information about the input, then this gives a very tight, or the tightest possible bound on epsilon will be for the smallest mutual information. Now, if you look at this bound, it's, it's a very surprising bound. I must say that I, don't, I didn't believe it myself for a while until we actually found other ways of proving it. Because this looks like a very, like, little bit of black magic, what I, what I did here. I mean, I'm using this typicality argument, and then I'm estimating the class of a function, which I'm not really using, because it depends on what partition I'm using. And the partition itself is changing during the training, which is a big no-no in learning theory. If you actually change your hypothesis class during the training, you, you are bound to overfit. That's what they all tell you. So I have to be very careful with this type of argument. But at least naively, this is uh, surprising. So look, when is this meaningful? This is meaningful when i is of the order of log m. Log of the, uh, the, the cardinal, the, the number of examples. OK, then only then when, this, when i is smaller than log m, this becomes meaningful on epsilon. So this is a bit surprising. Log m seems like a very n small number. I mean, let's say I have millions of examples. So log m, let's talk decimal, is 6. So I have a, I need 6. Uh, I need a compression to essentially, m has to be, I mean, i has to be 6 for million examples. It's a very small number to make sense. But now if you know a little bit more about learning, you ask, there's a notion of a sample comp compression in learning which is really a very old notion. It's, it goes all the way to the 80s, to, to Warmoth and Littleson and people like this, uh, which is how many labels you really need. What, not if you get random labels, random patterns, but how, what is the minimal number of labels you need if I can ask the smartest possible questions? This is called the query complexity. If I do active learning, I, I don't have to label everything. I have to label very few. Now, if you know something about support vector machines, let's say, so these are exactly the support vectors. I mean, the very few points which I know, if I know their labels, I know the labels everything else. Or if you know what is the minimum, and this is precisely, in general, of order of the log of the number of patterns, of random patterns. So only the log of the number of random patterns are, are really need the labels. And mutual information, by its very definition, is the minimal number of labels that I will need in order to actually generalize. So that's why this makes perfect sense, that m, the i's of the order of log m, where, where log m is essentially the query complexity of my data. OK, so now the question is whether it actually works. Does it give me better bounds? So if you look, even in my, in my, in my movie, the last, the last uh, the, the, the mutual information gets below log m, not at the beginning, but at the very Last layers, eventually, eventually it goes below log m, and then it's actually starting to generalize. That's what this, this, this bound is telling you. So I'm going to use this bound. OK, so this is a, a little bit tricky, I know. We actually have a, a nice paper that proving this bound in a very rigorous way, including this worry about generalization. Because in principle, first of all, there are many, many possible partitions. So as I said, I mean, you can have the same information with Many, many possible partitions, and when I go in, in a low information about why, there are many, many possible partitions, all the possible partitions of my data. So obviously there's something, this bound becomes meaningful only when you get high in the information plan. OK, so how high you can get in the information plan? So that's really where this uh, information bottleneck things uh, come into the game. So, so I want to explain it uh, as much as I can without boring you too much. So in general, 
So I know, so I told you that already in order to generalize, you must get high. I'm now telling you that if you really want a few samples, you also want to get left because you want to reduce this ITX. So now, so ITX, so IX accept, it's just a different notation for the same thing, the representation, uh, is, uh, is, has to be small. So the question is how far they can go in this plan? Okay, so if you're a physicist, uh, what would you do in order to solve this question? I mean, any, uh, you, you simply maximize. I mean, or let's see what is the, the maximum information that I can get at a given compression. This, I call this the compression of the representation. I mean, a given, a given compression of the representation. Or, or in other words, what is the minimum compression or the maximum compression? I mean, the minimum IXX hat that you can get at a certain level of IXY. So this is a, a very simple uh, variational problem. What you do is minimizing IX hat X over all possible encoders subject to a constraint on i x at y. This will give you the limit. And you put a Lagrange multiplier, which I call here beta, which has to be a positive Lagrange multiplier because I actually want to minimize the function subject to a positive constraint. This beta looks very much like one over temperature. So that's why I mean, it looks like one. And actually, that's exactly the intuition we had for many years. So beta is, in some sense, a resolution a resolution parameter which controls the size of those covers. So very large beta is very high, small temperature, low temperature, which means a very fine cover. Very low beta is high temperature, which means a very coarse cover. So some algebra, which is really not difficult, shows that, by the way, this proving this, if you, don't, if you can't do it, it's actually a trivial thing. I mean, you just take the KL divergence, and no. Py given x, take the log ratio of Py given x, Py given t, and, and write it as a, a difference between log Py given x and Py minus uh, log Py given t and Py, and, you, and that's it. End of story. So now I'm actually using something similar here. That's why I, I got back to it. So essentially, the interesting story about this particular uh, variational problem that it has an explicit solution or implicit solution, if you want, because it's a, so it tells you the optimal encoder, which means are those on the line beyond which there's there are no encoders at all, is given by this exponent of the KL divergence between PY given X and PY given the representation. There's a bracket missing here. Okay, so, uh, so this is a, uh, this is nice in some sense, because remember, this was a bound on the error, the generalization error. So essentially, it's telling you that a good compression will have small generalization. OK, that's nice. And everything else is, is, is just you know, technical. I mean, this is a normalization, some sort of a partition function. So there's this z there. And this, is the opt the, this equation has to be self-consistent in the sense that the encoder the decoder here has to be this optimal base decoder in red. So essentially what these equations are telling you, the decoder and the encoder are self-consistently related through these equations. This is coming from there, and this goes there, and you iterate. So this is what we call an implicit solution. I mean, I need to solve it iteratively, and, and Bert can tell you a lot of things it's not always converging, it's not, it's not a convex problem. It cannot be in general, because there are all sorts of different phases here. There are all sorts of suboptimal solutions. But in principle, it's very simple. This is exponent of the bound on the error, the KL divergence between the prediction from the data and the prediction from the representation. This was T in all my other slides. <laughs> it's the same thing. And, uh, and this is the best you can do with this particular encoder. So you just iterate them. And this is just to, to keep uh, the probabilities correct. So you have, you have to also estimate the marginal correctly. I was slightly confused. In your movie, I could get to the top left of the picture. Yeah, it was not the top left. I'll go back to the movie and see that there is a slight curvature there. Oh, okay. it, so it was, the, it was just slightly stochastic. Okay. Because it was slightly stochastic, it didn't get to perfect one bit, but a little lower than it. I'll come back to that. That's a good question. So here I'm exaggerating. I'm talking a very stochastic rule. And what I, I want to say is that, in general, this black line is the solution of those iterative equations. 
for different values of beta. And actually, for the same reasons that you saw, see it in thermodynamics, let's say, that you know, beta is the Lagrange multipliers of the energy in the free energy. So uh, essentially, the slope of the energy entropy trade of in thermodynamics is, is beta or one over beta. And just like here, one over beta is the slope of this curve. So actually, there is a, a finite slope at the origin, which is actually an interesting phenomenon. It's called the, the lower critical beta, below which you don't get any solution. So if beta is too low, which is around order one, you don't get any, uh, there's no solution to this equation, no, no non-trivial solution. I mean, the only solution is independence at the origin there. But once you increase beta, you start climbing on this convex or concave curve, the black line, and eventually when beta goes to infinity, the slope goes to zero, it's one over beta, and this is the high resolution limit. Okay, where essentially you keep all the information. But what is really interesting, that this is an information theoretic bound. I mean, there are no encoders above this line, no matter with what algorithm. Given the rule, this is a wall. Even an alien coming from another galaxy will not do better than this line. Okay. So now the interesting question is whether my algorithm is actually pushing me to this line. Whether, whether there's anything in the stochastic gradient the same, which is actually forcing us to, to be close to this line in some sense. This was the mystery I had for five years ago. So essentially if I put a, you know, at that time we actually put a neural network like this, I mean, H1, H2, and so on, and we knew that uh, it has to be moved, it has to move up, but he had absolutely no idea what was happening until we did the simulations. The simulation showed us these very interesting trajectories, which, are, which have to be understood. I mean, this, you can't just leave it like this. But what is really, really interesting about this, uh, this line, or this problem of uh, finding compact encoders for a given generalization error, or for a given information about Y, is that I don't usually, so, so there are two, two other details in this picture which I want to, I come back to. One of them was those suboptimal blue lines. So those, those are some sort of bifurcations which have to do with topological changes in my encoder. I'm going to spend the rest of tomorrow's talk mostly talking about the nature of those bifurcations, why they're so important, what's so interesting, and why they're eventually going to determine what the layers of the neural network is going to encode. But uh, there's this red line. This red line is really important. So remember that uh, we never have the joint distribution of PXY. I mean, if we have it, uh, I don't have to do anything. So what we get is a sample. We only have a, a finite sample of PXY. We have training data. So I want to talk a little bit about, about the nature of this line. So essentially, I can recast the, the theorem, the, the generalization error that I had before. So let's say I, I now call P empirical, or P EMP, the empirical distribution which I get from a finite sample. Okay, so you can think about it any way you want, like a sum of delta functions on your samples, or you can think about it as a, some sort of a histogram or whatever, some crammy estimate of your, your distribution. And what we have, so essentially, is how far the error using the empirical distribution can be from using the full distribution. So essentially, if you want, this, this base optimal decoder, let's say that I don't have all the data, I have only a sample here, so I can't really use this complete sum because I don't have all the data, and I'm only summing on the sample here. So then I'm going to get some sort of an proxy of this, which can be very noisy if the sample is small. So this is, in some sense, the best the network can do using the finite sample. So we wanted the bound on the difference between the true mutual information and the actual mutual information. And eventually this is something was proven by Ohad Shamir and uh, together with Ohad Shamir and uh, Sivan Sabato in 2008, we have a long paper on the bottleneck and generalization, which is essentially just establishing this right curve. And you see, this looks familiar. <laughs> so essentially what we know is that the true mutual information is related to the empirical mutual information plus something which looks like two to the i over m times the cardinality of y, which is two. There's actually a two here, but never mind. So it's, it's the order of the square root 
But this was exactly my previous bound, if you remember, 2 to the i over m, square root was this epsilon. So this is essentially the same thing, but here it is actually proved in an entirely different way using the McDermott inequalities and, and very careful uh, convergence, uh, empirical convergence analysis. You can read it in this paper, 2008. But what it tells you that the difference between the true information and the empirical information scales, grows like 2 to the i uh, over m. With square root, okay, I don't care about square root. So what we plotted here, the, 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 red, the red curve, is precisely that. So if this is your empirical information, in this case, think about the, the black line as the best you can do with the sample. What the bound is telling you that the red line is what you're actually going to learn eventually. Now, because of this 2 to the i factor there, I'm going to do worse when 2 to the i is very large. So this gap is exponential in the information compression. And of course, so if I undercompress, if I'm on this side of the story, I'm going to have a huge uh, missing generalization. Now think about it this way. This is very easy to understand. I mean, imagine that here in the high end, I have this very fine partition of my x, but I don't have enough labels. So many of those partitions are going to be empty. I don't have enough labels to label all of them. So I'm going to be empty, I mean, no labels, I'm going to make a random prediction there. So if I have very few labels and very fine partition, most of the cells are going to be empty, and I'm going to make a very poor prediction. On the other hand, if I'm compressing too much, then my, my, my uh, compression bound is going to kill me. So there's somewhere in between where this bound gets to the maximum information which is exactly the point where I have enough labels for all my partitions. And then I'm, so essentially, this is where this becomes of order one, where 2 to the i essentially tell me, or 2 to the i is the number of partitions, the number of clusters, the number of components, where I get essentially m of the, this order, then I have enough labels that I need the square root because I need a little more than one, a little few more. So when m gets essentially the size of the partition, I have the best generalization. OK, so it's the red line which I really want to worry about. So now think about the neural network again. The layers are going to compress. And eventually, they want to put the last layer here. This is the best you can do. Okay, if I manage to put the last layer there somehow, then I'm, I'm going to do well. That's, that's the essence of the story. And remember that everything here was based on this the fact that it's mutual information that matters is based on this typicality argument, and that's why I'm calling it large scale learning. Okay. Sorry, uh, yes. This bound, uh, so you're considering the data only on the y and not on the x. No, no, I'm thinking the, bar, the, the y, I, I want to, to bound the generalization error. So this is just a, a difference with, the, this is the generalization gap in disguise. I mean, I just showed you that information and generalization are relative to each other. So the difference in these two is the same as the difference in the error, the total error, which is this, the average error, and the empirical error. It's the same thing. And it's just a gap written in a funny way. So that's, that's why we, we put this curve. So it's the red curve, and you see that in general, you're going to have two types of losses, which are losses in information, therefore losses in generalization. One of them is the compression loss, which is something you have to do if you want to move to the left, unless you have a. Uh, but in the bound, uh, you are using i of dx, which is a good distribution. Yes, you're right. This is, this, is, this is a proxy to the empirical one. I don't really know the true distribution. What I'm telling you is that it's going to be governed by that. So this is why I call it a useless bound, because you don't have the true distribution. If you replace this by the empirical bound, you can have a lot, a much larger error. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's something I'm swallowing, I'm putting under the rug at this point, okay? So you're right, I mean, this is not a very practical thing. Because in order to estimate this, you, you need to know the true distribution or an estimate of this compression, and this can be widely, uh, because it depends on the cardinality of x in a very ugly way. So if you look at this paper with, with, with Ohad and Sivan, you'll see that, these are, that this is tricky, I mean, indeed here. I, I'm, so this is not cheating, it's just, making it useless, but it's all right. <laughs> okay, so uh, you caught me. 
But on the other hand, uh, I, I want to emphasize here that in general, you're going to have these two losses, the, the compression loss, which is the bottleneck. Even if I had the true distribution and I want a compressed representation, I will lose the first part. And then the difference between the red and the, and the, and the black is what I call the finite sample loss. And of course, if I have more data, this will, this will climb up and eventually reach, get very close to the black line at some point. Now, in the, everything here is stretched. In the, in the picture that I showed you, in, the, in this uh, simulation, you can see here that actually there is a slight curvature. And you see that there is actually a, curv a curved line there. It, it's, it's just very, very close to a straight line that drops from two, from one bit to, to zero, which is the deterministic limit. But the deterministic limit is not interesting here. So because of a, a relatively very small noise was added to the law, to the rule here, I'll come back to what this rule is exactly yesterday, tomorrow when I talk about symmetries. It's, it's actually very interesting what happens there. But so just notice that there is a slight curvature there. It's not, it's not a perfect line. And I actually argue that this slight curvature is precisely the, the limit, the, the bottleneck limit, asymptotically. So if this is true, essentially what I'm telling you is that the number of encoders is very high when you're low in this plan. There are many, many random encoders with very poor information about why. But when you get higher, this number of encoders is diluted very, very quickly. And when you get to the line, it's the solution of the bottleneck problem, essentially a single encoder up to permutation of the clusters, and which is really not informative. It's a single encoder which uh, encodes the, the data perfectly. Then nothing. So this is a unique solution. Now, if the layers of the network, which, are, which don't know anything about bottlenecks, unless you're Stefano Soato and you actually plug the bottleneck into your cost function. But I don't do that. So, uh, uh, so that some people are doing this. I'm using the bottleneck uh, function as a regular, regularizer. I don't like it because I, I want to show that even if you don't do it, eventually you are pushed to this limit. And once you are close to the black line in the plan, the bottleneck equations are enforced on you. I mean, you must use them because that's the only, the only game there. That's the only encoder that can work in the, near this bound. So in some sense, the bottleneck solution is the solution, the network for each one of the layers, if indeed they reach a very good generalization. Yes? Yes. If I, if I trade what you just said, right, uh, from my level of understanding, I guess you're saying that uh, all the areas below uh, the red curve. Yes. I, I, by the way, I want it to be perfectly understood. If it's not. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, but yeah. Maybe I, I do not have the same level of mathematical skills that you have. I'm sure you do. It's all right. I try to get a more intuitive understanding. Yes. So, say that, uh, uh, well, I have the red curve, right? So I guess what you're saying is that uh, all the areas. Yes, empirical encoders are always below the red curve. But if they don't compress enough, as I said, many of those cells are going to be empty. You're not going to predict well. So you want, to you want the, the cells to be sufficiently coarse to eventually get enough labels to label all of them. But if I now go uh, to the decoding, right? I guess what you're saying is that uh, you know, given a level of compression, uh, right. Uh, right. I can have all possible y, x, x y, oh, oh, sorry, information about, uh, about the label. But, uh, only when I reach the red line, right. I'm going to be optimal, say. Yes. And this is uh, what is going to bring my representation eventually to be also linear and separable. Because eventually, as you say. Yeah, you're jumping ahead. I'm going to talk about linear separability okay. eventually. Okay. I, I'm not going to. This is important. What? You're right. No. That, that, that this, the fact that I coarsen my representation and I force the, this, this partition to be homogeneous with small distortion, which means the same probability of label in all the partition. This is what this distortion measure means. Uh, I'm going to eventually generalize well and lin be lin linearly separable. That, that's another issue. It's a, it's, a, it's a separate issue, and it's very important. I'm not going to delay it. Uh, so I just want to summarize this part of the talk. What is the time now? How much time do I have? About half an hour. OK. Yeah, OK. I, I, I wanted to have a break right here, but it's a little bit uh, too late for a break. <laughs> so I'm going slowly. So this is just to show you what happens with finite samples. So if this is the information plan trajectories, color here is the number of epochs. So black is zero epochs, 
yellow is 10,000 epochs, okay? And in between, I'm going through these uh, colors, okay, linearly. Now, what you see here is uh, when I train it on 80% of the data, uh, 2 to the 12 patterns, 4,096, 80% is about 3,000, okay? So uh, uh, here it's well trained, and you see that those trajectories, I mean, they go to this line and eventually compress and converge to a very high line there. It looks almost straight. When you reduce the number of data points, so this is 45% of the data, and this is 5% of the data, you see this very nice collapse. I mean, essentially, okay, the first part, they go all the way to the green line, essentially in the same way. Even with very small data, they get to this line, which, I call, which is a very important line. I'm going to talk this transition from, from uh, uh, learning about the data to compressing the data. And, and they, but then the compression actually hurts you. You see that information goes down. You don't even get close to, so there's another line here which can be calculated, which is essentially this red line. Uh, uh, it's actually some sort of a crossover between the red and the black, but this is the finite sample bottleneck line, which I'm not going to discuss today. But you see what happens. So this is as close as you can see here, what we call overfitting. Why? Because you don't have enough data, but you try to compress more than you need. So I call it actually overcompression. And then you get poorer information. Why is that? You actually good, get good compression in the sense that large, large, very coarse partition, but the labels are very sparse. So you don't have a very, very reliable estimate of the distortion, and therefore you, you miss. So this is essentially overfit. This is well-trained, and you see that there's some crossover in between, which essentially amounts to this bottleneck curve bending <laughs> with the data. That's actually a very nice piece of the theory, which I'm not going to discuss today. Okay, so this is the finite sample story. In, now we want to understand, first of all, is it a general story? So this is, by the way, what happens in an entirely different problem. This is a committee machine, for those of you who know what it means. This is a network a neural network we, we really love to play in the 80s because it's uh, analytically solvable in some limits. Uh, so essentially, each neuron here is a majority. So you think about each, uh, the first layer, let's say, is a random committee. So each, each, each unit is uh, some random projection of my space. And then I take a vote, like in committees, and then the output is a majority. And I do it several times. So this is a cascade of committees. <laughs> and you see that in this case, Okay, uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't talk about the, the, the curve to the right, but uh, I'll talk about it in a second. You see, but you see the same type of trajectories, so the layers go up and then left, and they do it very quickly. It's a much easier problem. Yes. And the, 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 the dynamic, the, 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 the limits are independent of that, but then the trajectories depend on that. I mean, the way, the way you reach the limit, so this is, by the way, what happens in MNIST, which is a real problem, you know, the, the Scarter recognition problem that you discussed uh, yesterday or two days ago. And so this is a real, real life. It's not really real life, but this was the famous uh, benchmark of, of machine learning. And you see, if you just, this is, by the way, ReLUs and not uh, sigmoids, and these are convolution neural networks, and before that I used uh, fully connected, uh, completely un unconstrained, and you see essentially the same type of picture, uh, even for single network. Uh, and by the way, you see this even for CIFAR, which was much harder to, to generate. This is CIFAR 10. So it's very hard to estimate the mutual information. It's a very high dimension. But it's enough for me to see sim a similar type of trajectories. OK, so, uh, so uh, it's true in every network we looked at. This is, by the way, a very interesting network which Chaim Sampolinsky asked me to, to, to try, which is essentially a network where all the layers have the same width. So there's no reduction in And you see that there's no, only the last layer has this very funny behavior. The other layers stay up. They don't lose information about X, about Y. They always keep all the information about Y because there's just some transformation, one-to-one -one transformation of the input. But, but they do compress. You see that they move. This one got here, this one got here. All the compression happens at the top layer, at the top line. And, and only when they compress, 
the last layer is doing this nice uh, improvement of generalization. So you see that the generalization improvement, which is the second part of the training, I mean, when, when you move from 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 bits to one bit, this is the most significant improvement in generalization, it happens together with the motion of all the other layers to the left, which means that they lose information about the input. So this is why uh, I, I, I say that essentially the, the important part of learning in terms at least of the number of epochs of training is the forgetting. I mean, learn to forget what's not important here data. So now I want to move to the second part. Yes. Question. Yes. 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 No, no, they all lie on this curve. No, they are constraining one another. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> of course, that's the whole point. They affect each other. This compression is not independent because of the Markov chain. So that's exactly where I'm coming now. Okay, so I want to understand the dynamics of this picture. I mean, and, I, and this, for this, I, I need to look at the SGD, at the stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so the first thing to do is to actually look at this movie again, but this time with the error. This is actually a generalization error, but it could, the training error looks very similar. And what you see is that this, this point where they start to move left, they start to compress, is precisely at the knee of the error. So the error goes down very quickly from 0 0.5 to about 0 0.1 within a few hundred epochs. Actually, in the, in the large problem in MNIST, it's only something like 10 epochs, or very, very fast. And then, essentially, the error flattens. So this is, think about it as a training error. This is the average training error, that's why it's so smooth. And you see that essentially this goes down very slowly, but actually most of the improvement in generalization is where it goes down from one over a thousand to one over a million. That's where people want to pay the money. I mean, this is really very important, this is very large. So this is a very misleading curve. It looks like flat, but you should look at it as an, in log-log scale or in logarithmic scale, and actually the most important and the most valuable part of the generalization error is really the last Really, when you move from uh, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 9, that's where you really want to be. So, and most of this happens where the layers compress up there. You see they move very slowly move. It's a bit slowed down, but you see that they very slowly move to the left. So what's going on here? I mean, well, how is stochastic gradient descent is doing this? Obviously, if everything is related to the knee in the error, so it's easy to see. I can show it on the board. The, app, the derivative of the error, now let's do this. This is a, this is a school after all, no? So, so the derivative of the error, so if you just look at the absolute, ab, absolute uh, value of the derivative of the error, is the sum over the layers, in this case, of the derivative of the error with respect to the weights and the case layer. So this is a, a shorthand, a short notation for the gradient of the error with respect to the layers, to the weights of the case layer. I'm, call it, I'm going to call it WK. Times the derivative of the layers with respect to time. Okay? This is just <laughs> taking derivatives. And this is true, for, and when I, K is going to be the number of layers. So this is true for every layer. Now, uh, stochastic gradient descent is telling me that dw to dt is uh, minus uh, the gradient of the error plus noise. Okay? So it's not really noise. This noise is tricky. I'm going to talk about it. It's different from every layer and it's state dependent and it's non isotropic and whatever you want. But its average is zero because it's actually the noise is defined as the difference between the mini batch. Remember mini batches? You heard about them? Yeah. The mini batch error and the actual error. So if you sum over all the mini batches, you get zero error. So this, is, this has a zero mean. So if I plug this here, I get that the derivative of the error is the sum of the gradients times the gradients plus the noise. And when you average, so I average this, and you average this, you get this is just the sum of the norm of the gradients with respect to each one of the layers, square. 
OK, so if the derivative goes down, the norms must go down. The magnitude of the norm must go down. No other way. So now, OK, so let's look at the gradients. That's the natural thing to do. So here is my problem at last. So this is the network I've been showing you all along. It's a six-layer neural network, which has this particular funny Eiffel shape, <laughs> Eiffel Tower shape. But that's not important. But what I do here is we plot for each layer, you see, in different colors, the weights, the gradients of the weights at each layer. And what you see here is the mean of the norm in the solid line, and then the standard deviation of the norm. So this, the standard deviation is calculated over the mini batches. So there are many mini batches. The, the batch size here was something like 200. And the size of the data was 3,000, so that's something like 12 mini batches or something. And, and they are completely independent. So what you see is a very striking phenomenon, which a lot of people reported, by the way. I'm not the only one to see this. You see that at the beginning of the training, this is a log-log plot. Yeah. So at the beginning, something up to 300. Do you remember the 300? This is the point where they start to curve. So up to there, the, the norm of the weights, uh, of the gradients, is much larger than the standard deviation. This means a very clean gradient. Essentially, no fluctuations. It's actually two orders of magnitude. Yeah. So it's really clean gradient. At this point, this is precisely at the knee of the error, where the error saturates, the derivative saturates, or the error saturates. And, the, and then you get this funny now, the, 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 the magnitudes go down by about an order of magnitude, which makes sense. And by the way, there is this nice dispersion according to the layers. You see that there is more, there's a lower gradient at the first layer and higher gradient at the last layer. But in the noise, you see precisely the opposite. The fluctuations jumped up about an order of magnitude above, above the mean. OK, that's uh, an order of magnitude most fluctuations than mean. This means noisy gradients. OK. So actually, I argue that this phase, up to about 300 epochs, epochs is a cycle through the data. Yeah? So it's a lot of updates, by the way, because I update every, every mini batch. So uh, up to here, I have what I call a high signal to noise gradient. That's why I call it high SNR. And, uh, and so this is eventually going to be a drift phase. If you think about the Fokker-Planck equation, the gradient is very clean. The fluctuation is very small. It's essentially all drift. At this point, the gradients are lower, but the fluctuation is much higher. So this is essentially a diffusion, maybe a slightly drifted diffusion, but highly diffusion. OK, so, and you see that this is from 300 to 9,000. By the way, here you begin to see what people call the collapse of the gradients. You, you begin to see this uh, very drop. So I, I'll show it to you later. So eventually, it's going to be very noisy beca because the, lay, the unit saturates. But you see that this transition from high to low SNR happens way before the collapse of the gradient. It's not the reason. This is, by the way, a misconception which was uh, published last year by uh, Andrew Zucks and his colleagues in Harvard and MIT, very good people. Made a lot of mistakes about our, our understanding of the theory, but never mind. I'm going to come back to that. So uh, one, another very convincing way of seeing this is to look at the norm of the gradients themselves. Remember, I don't have any regularization, and I don't have weight decay, and I don't have any, any specification or anything like this. So essentially, the gradients are just growing. And this is, again, a log-log norm. This is the average magnitude of the gradients. You see that up to, so this, this number changed because it's the number of iterations, the number of updates, not the number of epochs. It's my mistake. This is a de facto of three, more or less, between this and this, or three and a half. It's the same thing. So you see that up to about 300 epochs, which is about 10, 1,500 uh, updates, there's a linear growth of the weights. OK, that's what we expect from a drift. Essentially, you just accumulate the gradient, and it's more or less linearly. So you see that the exponent is 1, more or less, if you can estimate it. Take a ruler and estimate it. <laughs> and from this point on, there's a very clear drop in slope. Now, if it was a pure diffusion in, on the plan, how would you expect it to grow? Like a square root of t. So then I expect the slope to go to be half. Now, if it's actually a rough plane and it's not entirely 
there are all sorts of anom anomalous diffusions, which can be lower or higher in the, in the diffusion exponent. So this is actually closer to 0.4 for, for some reason, but it's close enough to half. Okay, so but this is this this is a knee in the log log plot of the magnitudes of the weights is another direct indication that in the second phase you're doing diffusion. Okay. So now, I, I, so this, as, as, as I said, grows more or less like square root of t. By the way, this is what you see. It's a bit noisy, but this is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I had to fix the title, but never mind. So essentially, these are the, the three po plots here for each layer. And what you see is the SNR of the gradients in blue. So you see that there's a very fast, sharp, sharp drop in the SNR. And you see again the magnitude of the weights, and you see that around this sharp drop, the, the slope of the, of the weight change. And you see that afterwards, the information between x and t, which is this purple, uh, this orange line, is dropping. So again, the compression is associated with the diffusion phase. It's very clear. So we see it in every way we look at it, either in the, directly in the information, or the gradients, or the slope of the gradients. There's something which has to do with losing information about the input in this compression phase. And it's true for all the layers in one way or another, even for this very small network. By the way, if you change the, so okay, this is again, uh, you see here the SNR of the gradient for each layer. And you see how fast it drops from one to 10 to the minus three, more or less. Very noisy gradients. Each layer is different color. Here, by the way, you get to this uh, saturated gradients and things become very noisy. So forget it. And this is as a function of the mini bit size. Now, this was again one of the claims of uh, Sachs that uh, they see compression even with full batch, which means that it's, I argue that it's the mini batch that is doing the trick. Because there's, but even with full batch, and you see the full batch is here, along the same line, you see that the number, the point of the transition from, from drift to diffusion is moving with the mini batch as expected, linearly with the mini batch size. So this is a function of the mini batch size, and this is, but if you actually look at the point of this infliction, the arg max of ITX, which is exactly the point where you get the maximum information about the input, it's exactly this green line that I saw before, you see that even in full batch, you are along this line. So there's some noise in the full batch. It's a small noise, but it's enough to cause diffusion eventually. What is the noise in the full batch? Well, in full batch, it's because you have an approximate discretized gradient calculated on the training data. There's a lot of noise there. I, I don't fully understand. I mean, I don't have a full theory, but I see empirically that the full batch is it's somewhere on this line which means that it behaves qualitatively uh, in, a, in the same way. So you're saying it's not essential to use stochastic gradient I'm saying that if you don't use stochastic gradient descent, I mean, you actually calculate an exact full batch gradient, you still have some level of stochasticity, and which behaves eventually like noise in the gradient. And of course, the, the diffusion phase is now delayed. You see that it moves from around 1,000 uh, epochs to 5,000 or 4,000 epochs. Yeah, essentially the same. The information plane picture say it just takes a long, much longer to get to these things. So now I'm going to argue again, again a question. Yes. There is a dependence field with the learning rate. I mean, because we are not talking about the learning rate. No, no learning, learning rate is fixed here. I mean, whatever it is. Okay? I'm not playing with it. You are right that there are all sorts of algorithms which do weight decay and do regularization and do and do and they change the learning rate. I, this is a really plain vanilla stochastic gradient descent in the simplest possible form. All of these are important. I argue that they're going to change the dynamics. I mean, they maybe accelerate, accelerate. The, or actually, I actually argue that if you dilute the weights too early, you're going to lose because you're going to slow diffusion. So I really want to argue why is this diffusion important. So this is a nice picture where we wanted to see the effect of the number of layers. So this is the first time we, we looked at it. You see the same problem with one hidden layer, two hidden layers, up to six hidden layers. And if you look at the colors, so I move from dark purple to, to yellow, you see that uh, here in the two, one hidden layer, essentially it takes forever to come to good transition. I mean, I, I'm somewhere in the up layer, and even there, I, the, the units here are 
not log two, but log uh, but lan, that's why it's 0.7, but 0.7 is one. <laughs> so essentially, uh, it never gets to very high generalization within our, our, our frame. But, but surprisingly, when you add hidden layers, the number of training epochs get lower. With six hidden layers, everything is, is here at the purple, and essentially you see that the layers get stuck at some point, nothing happens from here on, more or less. You see this by the, it's red here, it's yellow here, which means this was the end point, but right next to it, it's here. Okay, so it didn't move much at the end. So essentially I, good, I get to very high generalization in the last layer already here. So this looks like a very dramatic effect. I mean, I, I, I reduce the time, the number of epochs by adding layers. So this immediately gave me I mean, this uh, very clear intuition. I mean, these layers are related in a Markov chain. So anything that I compress in the lower layers is also is lost to the higher layers. So there's something like a train, you know, they push each other. Now, if I add more layers, they do this parallel diffusion. Each layer is moving independently because the noise is independent for each of the layers. So, so let's look at this more carefully. Mm. Yeah, I lost some animation here, but never mind. I, I copied the slide yesterday from another place, and you know, when you move from PowerPoint from one, 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 one presentation to the other, everything changes, and you know, I have no control over it. Anyway, so now I'm going to prove to you, this is uh, one of the highlights uh, of today, in five minutes, <laughs> that this compression is actually due, it's actually happening in the linear part of the neurons, and it's independent of the nonlinearity. It's not really true, because of course the nonlinearity can enhance it. If there is saturation of the units, it will compress better. But I don't need the nonlinearity in order to do the compression. It's really a dynamic effect of the diffusion. So here's an, the analysis we do. So essentially, remember what happens here. Essentially, this is that the pictures you have to have in mind is that during the drift phase, the energy drops significantly into something which a lot of people call flat minima. And essentially, you get, you, you get into through a ridge like a crater. <laughs> you fell down, fall down, and then, and then you essentially ra randomly move on, on a ver relatively flat surface. Now, for most people, this means, okay, I have to stop when I go to the flat minima. Why should I continue? But actually, we see in the, everything that I showed you so far is that this, this during random walk in the flat crater actually improved generalization significantly. So stochastic so gradient descent is doing something very different than just curve fitting. I'm not just fitting the data. I'm, this dynamic effect of diffusion is going to improve my generalization. I want to show you how. So I already convinced you, I hope, that compressing the representation is good for generalization. But uh, how does it happen? So essentially, if you look at the covariance matrix of the weights, let's say the Haitian matrix of my energy or my error at this local minima. So now I'm in a linear problem for each layer separately. This is a very elongated covariance matrix. So you know, in two dimensions, this is the best I can do. But, so there are very few dimensions which are important which I call the relevant dimension. This is this low dimensional manifold that a lot of people talk about. I mean, essentially, eventually, I mean, let's say I do face recognition, there are maybe 20 numbers or 20 features that I really need to worry about. You know, the eye difference, the nose, the, the hair, whatever. 20 numbers is a good estimate. <laughs> Everything else, I mean, all the million dimensions of the weights are essentially irrelevant. What it means, that changes of the weights in these directions is not going to affect the error. Because it's irrelevant. I mean, I, so changes of the weights in this direction is flat with respect to the error. Now, so this is uh, the way I drew it here just by this very elongated ellipse. It's actually very, very low. It's not exactly flat, but there's a very big drop in the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. Now, most of the dimensions are here in the irrelevant dimensions. Now, when you start to diffuse, what happens? I mean, you, you, you start to do a, a winner process. You just accumulate these random gradients, which are not suppressed because nothing is going to suppress them. They just accumulate in this diffusion file. And essentially what it means that the weights at the K layer 
are going to some matrix, which I, at this point, want to call the CCA matrix. So CCA stands for Canonical Correlation Analysis. But it's actually some sort of projection to the relevant dimensions. This is really the important part of what we call PCA is doing the same thing, but on the, in the variable themselves. But if I want actually the, the projection of the, date of, the, of, the, of the data such that the variability of the, of the label is minimized, is maximized, I want to keep maximum information, this is called CCA. You can read about it uh, elsewhere. So uh, this is the best projection. But then I have this, what I call delta W, where delta W is this diffusion matrix in all the irrelevant dimensions. So this is starting to grow. Now look at the map from the layer K to the layer K plus one. So here, here is just a, a simple, uh, simple abbreviation. So essentially this sigma is the nonlinearity, which can be a sigma, it can be a ReLU, it can be whatever you want. It can be just linear. Of, of this W, times the previous layer, this one, plus delta W times the previous layer. That's what's happening here, okay? So it's a matrix times the previous layer. That's the whole trick of neural networks. And that's all there is there. But this matrix in high dimension is a random winner process, which grows like square root of T in simple diffusion. So, and the covariance of this delta W is very much like the covariance of the gradients because, you know, it's just growing, growing in the high, in the, in the, in the flat dimensions like square root of T. And in the relevant dimension, it essentially doesn't grow. So this delta W, when I multi, it's, it's a random Gaussian numbers which are accumulated like a winner process in every component separately. And when I multiply it by the previous layer, since these are essentially independent from each other, it looks like random Gaussian noise. So that's something which physicists buy immediately, and for mathematicians, I really have to work hard to convince them, but you can actually prove it. So this behaves like a normal distribution with the same covariance, but the magnitude of this W is growing with T, like diffusion. That's why it's growing slowly with T. Okay, so now I'm going to try to use this. So essentially, the, the map from Tk to Tk plus one is a stochastic map, which is made out of two parts, a linear part, which is a linear function plus noise. This is what we call in information theory Gaussian channel. Essentially, it's a linear function plus noise, sorry. So this is a Gaussian channel. And then there's some nonlinearity, which due to data processing inequality again, can only reduce information. OK, so the information is bounded by the maximum information that can transfer through this linear channel, which is again the Gaussian channel capacity. So how many of you heard about the Gaussian channel capacity? Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. So I, I, need to, I need to actually go through the detail, but my time is up. So, so this is the Gaussian channel. It's one of the plus the, the SNR ratio. So this time t is the, the signal, and this time t is the noise. And what you get there is this SNR. So one log of 1 plus SNR is the capacity of the Gaussian channel. This is a very important formula in information theory. So this is a bound on the information on the channel. So I just want one more slide, and, and the rest will be tomorrow. So essentially, I can, I can work out this bound. And you see, so eventually, I know that delta W is growing with T, like square root of T, or some, some diffusion exponent. So let's call it lambda IT. And AII are now the, the, the principal, the, the eigenvalues of the covariance the CCA matrix. So here I'm doing two tricks. I mean, first, I diagonalize everything in the dimensions of, of the CCA. So AI are fixed. And, then, and the lambda I is the projection of the noise on the CCA matrix. By the way, you know I, asymptotically these two things commute because the Haitian matrix and the covariance of the gradients are very similar to each other eventually. So I don't really need to work too hard here. I just diagonalize it over these principal components or principal channels. And then since this is growing with time, this is going to be a constant. So uh, here's something is missing. Yeah, it's going to be a constant which depends on the relevant dimension plus something which is going to decay like 1 over t to the alpha eventually. I'm going to repeat this tomorrow in a much clearer way. The nice thing is that it gives you very, this very surprising result. So, so the information is bounded by a constant which depends on the relevant dimension 
plus something which grows like t to the minus alpha, where alpha is the diffusion exponent. Because this is the single to noise ratio. So all I did is approximate the log by log of 1 plus x by x. This is OK if x is small. And then it's bounded anyway. And then I assume that I have the same diffusion exponents for all the layers, or at least I take the worst of them, and I take it out. And what you see is that the information is decaying to this constant in a rate which is, which is essentially a power law which depends on the diffusion coefficient. OK, so, so the, the real gist of it is that if I have these uh, completely independent diffusion subspaces in every layer, I'll come back to this tomorrow. This is very important. It has to do with diffusion. And alpha is somewhere between half and zero. Anyway, I, for any alpha, I get this interesting relation. The time to com of convergence with k layers is k to the minus 1 over alpha, where alpha is this diffusion coefficient, the time of a single layer. So this is a power law decay, decay of time. I just want to show you how it looks in reality. And then I stop. This is the number of iterations. This is the number of layers. The red line is the power law, the expected power law. The blue line is the measurements. So it's perfectly obeyed by the networks. The time of convergence scales like a power law which depends on the diffusion coefficients with the number of layers. More layers, less iterations. OK, so now the question, is this always true? Or is there something special about my problem? And uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow and about symmetries and other things. All right, thank you.